would seem to be this period, I think really from the late 60s to the sort of mid 80s, when particularly with analog synthesizers, um, every country seemed to be trying to outdo every other one. And there was this kind of race, in a way, a bit like the space race, where there were the walls were up between them all and they were all beavering and doing their thing and it was all top secret and then the Japanese would come out with a, another kind of amazing synthesizer and presumably the Americans would be going, how do they do that? You know, now we're going to go polyphonic, now we're going to go polyphonic. And whatever it was, you know, it was this kind of arms race of, of um, synthesized music, you know. And in a way, that generated amazing amount of creativity. I've been reading this book called Analog Days by Trevor Pinch and uh, I thought what was really interesting was this, the actual little stories behind all these inventors and I thought there was a similarity between kind of what the inventors went through getting their instruments and uh, doing something that they loved and was, were inspired to do like a real passion for it. And then having to deal with the business side of things and often not dealing with it very well. It was kind of seemed a bit like us, where we just enjoy making the music and making the tune. But then the business side of it, you kind of, you have to pass it on to someone else and sometimes it doesn't quite go right. So well, we had the idea of, making an album that looks not just at the instruments but kind of paid tribute to some of these where they're all men aren't they? to these chaps that uh, gave us these kind of weird and wonderful machines so we narrowed it down to eight inventors and inventions or companies and it's it turned out it was like four American companies and uh, four kind of British companies. So Moog was the obvious one to start with. Obviously he had the massive breakthrough with um, working with Wendy Carlos and the Switched On Bark album. And yeah, Moog became another word for synthesizers. During the early 1960s, I was fascinated with all kinds of new electronic music. And um, I was uh, also uh, just beginning to do some private teaching. And the dad of one of my students told me that there was a really interesting article that he read in a, in a magazine, and it was an article on the theremin. Uh, he gave me the magazine, and the article was written by Bob Moog. I had no idea who he was, but it was a very interesting article about building your own theremin. And when I saw that, I thought, that is really a fascinating way to get into this world of electronic music that I was just beginning, I had just gotten out of college, and I was just beginning to really think about what a fascinating world this could be. And so I uh, contacted the Moog house. Uh, he lived at that time in Ithaca, New York. And there was a phone number in the article. And so I contacted the house and I spoke to uh, his wife and ordered a theremin kit, which was $49.50. In 1963, at the very end of the year, I had just started teaching college and I, uh, decided I would like to go to the New York State all-state program where all the high school students were, the best high school students were playing, and it was up uh, in, uh, in Rochester, New York. And um, when I got to the uh, all-state festival, 
lo and behold, <laughs> I discovered a little room where uh, some people were uh, able to demonstrate them things that they were selling that might be of interest. And I walked into the room and there was a room full of theremins and tubas. And one tall young man was there and I walked over and it turned out that this young man was Bob Moog. And I said, Have, what are you doing in electronic music? And Bob really didn't know much about electronic music. He obviously knew a great deal about electronics and engineering. He was working on his doctorate in, in uh, physics at that time. And he was an amateur musician, but that was not his main direction. And so we started to talk about electronic instruments and we immediately started talking about the synthesizer, the only instrument at that time that was called a synthesizer now, this is 1963, was the RCA Mark II synthesizer, which was actually a room full of equipment that was at Columbia University. And I said to Bob, wouldn't it be interesting if we, if there was such a thing as a small instrument like that and for three hours nobody got Bob's attention and I don't think he sold anything and all we did was sit around and talk about the idea that perhaps there could be a synthesizer made. Now that was December of 63. In January of 64, I was giving a concert in Greenwich Village, New York. And after the concert, he was there with his wife and I was there with my wife. And we immediately talked about building a music synthesizer. That night in January of 64, that was followed briefly and very, not really not that briefly by Bob inviting me to come to his uh, studio, which he had just moved to a little town called Trumansburg, which is right outside of Ithaca. And he was making amplifiers to, uh, and you know, just trying to make a living. And he sent me an invitation. I gave it to my university. And the chair of the university who loved electronic music said, this would be fascinating. Let's see if the university will give you some research money and go up to develop a brand new musical instrument. And the university did. They gave me $200. And <laughs> it's a story that's often been told, but for $200, I went up to Trumansburg, New York, and worked there for two weeks, and we basically developed what was the basic Moog synthesizer. The concept of the original Moog right away was that there were little individual modules that did things. Uh, one of them was an oscillator uh, to produce sound. Now, oscillators had been around already. They had been used for various things, but never specifically uh, like this. And an amplifier and Bob's immediate idea was to have voltages control the pitches. And uh, the oscillators were voltage controlled. That was Bob's most important contribution to the building of musical instruments at that time. Uh, we, he was having trouble getting the instrument in tune and, I, and we talked about voltage control in that way and Bob said, oh, I get it. If you tune, uh, you can generate a voltage to control a basic instrument, a basic pitch. And that pitch could be, say, one volt. And an octave higher could generate two volts. So if we put a one twelfth of a volt resistor in between each of these, it would generate an even 12 tones. And that would be what 300 years ago Bach called well-tempered tuning. Once we had designed that concept, um, the first thing that Bob said was he had spoken to Vladimir Yusachevsky, 
who was at Columbia University, and Vladimir was working with that huge room full of instruments called the RCA synthesizer. But Vladimir had no keyboard and said to Bob, don't put a keyboard on it. And Bob said to me, should we have a keyboard? <laughs> and uh, I said, yes, because it would work without a keyboard. You could just touch things to create the, all, of this, um, all of this music because, but I said, put a keyboard on it because having a keyboard did not, it did not stop the early 20th century composers from developing new music like 12-tone music, atonal music, explorations of music and sound. But it'll also give you something that would make the instrument interesting and into the, put it into the hands of players. And you will probably make more money if you put a keyboard on. The other thing that we discussed right away, and this was very early on within the first week in June of 1964, that, that what we discussed at that point was articulation of music. That is, music, musical instruments have an attack. They have a decay. All musical instruments, when you blow an instrument, it will go ta, and that will be an attack. When you press a key down on a piano, it strikes a string, and that's an attack. When you hold your finger down after that, the note decays. And Bob and I explained that to Bob. He didn't understand that. So, but as soon as I explained it to him, he immediately knew how to do it and literally sent me out of the place to buy a, he said, go across the street and buy a push button door, doorbell uh, button. And I went back with, came back to him with a doorbell button and he had already designed the concept of when you press, now this was an instrument that was only a keyboard, it wasn't doing anything else. When you play a note, he said, also push the doorbell button. And in the little circuit that he designed, when you push the doorbell button, again, using voltage control, it would turn on the amplifier and then the amplifier would allow the sound to die away. And then he put controls in it to allow for the amplification to be picked up and he, had, he designed what was called a tack and became the most basic function of all analog instruments, a tack, decay, sustain, and release. ADSR, the basis of all analog instruments approach to true musical sound. Moog Modular had its kind of fledgling beginnings in the mid-60s. And by around 1967, 1968, its usage became a little bit more popular, both in academic studios and recording studios, uh, but mostly as a sound effect machine. It wasn't until late 1968 and early 1969 with the advent of Wendy Carlos's Switched On Bach that the Moog Modular was truly used as a musical instrument. And with that groundbreaking recording, the Moog Modular became known as a musical instrument um, to listeners everywhere and also caught the attention of musicians. Um, it was that recording, in fact, that caught the attention of Keith Emerson, who heard it playing in a record store in London, and he decided he must have an instrument like that. And there were many other musicians who did take the Moog Modular and incorporated it into their music, um, which, was, which was a pioneering effort in itself. These were um, pioneering synthesists who were figuring out how this new instrument, you know, could be incorporated into the, the language of music. On the flip side of that, there were also um, many musicians who, who kind of uh, jumped on the band, bandwagon of the Moog Modular um, as, as more of a novelty instrument. And uh, the result was a, a whole rash of um, 
we could say mold exploitation or um, other kinds of switched on recordings that were not quite to the the musical, technical, and artistic level um, of certainly Wendy Carlos's work. I heard a rumor, and it's only a rumor, that um, in, back in the mid '60s, you know, the Beatles had a modular, and a, you know, it became the thing to have, you know. And the Rolling Stones allegedly ordered one and set it up and couldn't make it work, couldn't get a sound out of it, um, which is fair enough if you haven't no background in synthesis and nobody's around you can show you what to do, you, you know, you can see how that could happen. And they sent it back to Moog think, saying, oh, this is, broke, this is broken, it doesn't work. And, you know, Moog tested it and they said, well, actually, it works fine, but they st the rumour is, is that something clicked in their mind and said, well, this is going to go to a lot of musicians who are not synthesists, they're not electronic musicians, they're just in a band and they want to get great sounds. And this is probably too complicated, we've got to make something more accessible to them. And I think that's how they came up with the pre-wired Minimoog. Because obviously, you, with anything with the, with the modular, you have to connect it with wires. You can't switch it on and expect it to make a sound. You've got to connect stuff together. And the pre-wired synth, like a Minimoog, you, you just press a key and you get some kind of a sound. So that's a rumor about the Stones. I don't know if it's true, but it's quite a good one. The fact that it drifted out of tune was an issue. Um, the fact that it was a very large instrument and heavy and cumbersome was another issue. And the fact that it was difficult to use was another issue. So as you might imagine, those three factors played into the demand for an instrument that would allow the musician to to bring synthesis into their music, but um, in a much more accessible way. And there was talk of a smaller, easier to use, more affordable instrument. My understanding from knowing what I do about Bob Moog is that he was very resistant to the idea of taking this musical instrument, the Moog Modular, that he worked so diligently and passionately to create an instrument that uh, his, his sole purpose was to really open up the sonic universe for musicians, to give them the highest capability of a sonic expression um, at their fingertips. He was hesitant to, to create an instrument that would limit that expressivity that he had dedicated himself to for so many years and that he had seen used with great effect. So he was initially resistant to the idea of a, a smaller synthesizer. Um, but we know from some of the documentation in the archives that he made a trip to England in 1969 to talk with Peter Zinovia, um, ostensibly about uh, to discuss uh, our AMOCO importing the VCS-3. And although nothing came of that, he did understand the demand for that kind of synthesizer. He just resisted creating one himself. The Mini Moog was developed during the late 60s, very gradually. It's really about 1969, which was the year that Bob was putting together a modular system for the Museum of Modern Art, for me to play. He, Bob was primarily pushing the idea of the modular instrument. That's what he loved. And that was his original concept. And when we built the first instruments, the idea of modular was the real answer. There was an engineer at the plant whose name was Bill Helmseth. And Bill Helmseth kept saying, Bob, this could be done in a simpler manner. We could make a smaller version of the Moog synthesizer. I don't know when the name Mini Moog came in, but it probably was around that time. Bob was not in favor of it at first. And Bill Helmseth said, this can be done. And he first came up with an instrument that he did basically by himself on his own out of things that were around in, in the factory. And they called it the Mini Moog Model A. And then they went to a Model B. 
And then they went to a Model C and they keep, kept improving it. And when they finally got to the Model D, that worked so well that Bob was persuaded, and this is an interesting thing, but a lot of people don't know. He was persuaded to build 100 of these and see if they would sell. And he got in touch with a person who wanted to be a salesman for him. And that salesman was a terrific salesman. And he went out and in fact took, I think, 16 of these things uh, and was able to sell them very, very quickly. And all of a sudden, the instrument was there. The instrument that you're looking at right now is number 94 of the first 100 Minimogs that were made. But by 1970, Minimogs started to be produced. And by the end of the 70s and into the 80s, it was the most familiar and most popular of all instruments. It was light, it was small, it could do all the modular things, but you didn't have to plug things in. All the modules were interconnected by switches and controls. And so the concept is still modular. The concept is, in fact, the way they were designed, and most smaller instruments were, was thinking from left to right on the instrument, which is a kind of modular thinking. The oscillators are here, they go into a mixer, which is here, and that went into a filter, which is here. And that filter design was the only item that Bob Moog was able to patent because a lot of the other things were already patented. But Bob was able to patent the design of his filter. And it did give a unique sound to the instrument and it was advertised quite frequently as the Moog sound. Yeah, it could be seen as a detrimental thing, but any sound you pull up on it, you think, oh, blimey, that sounds like, oh, that sounds like autobahn by Kraftwerk. An unmistakable sound, wouldn't it? You know, that sounds like someone like Bernie Worrell from Parliament or something like that. You know, it's, it's got that going for it, but it is a great sound, you know. You line it up against other synths and you play it, and it, it's just quality. It's quality and it's dirty and it's... What I like about it is like, I use one live quite a lot. It's just so quick to change the sound as well. You kind of know your way around. It's like, it's amazing that that instrument was laid out by the Moog engineers, the designer. It's come, become the standard, you know, and it's, yeah, it's, it's just, for me, playing live, it's amazing. I don't really like using presets and stuff like that. I like the, the battle of changing sounds and stuff, and I think, it, it's, it's the best symphony for, for live work when it stays in tune, when you can get it in tune and stuff. But you know, it's not, not such an issue, that's part of the battle as well. I think for me, um, I wasn't a Moog fan, Moog fan at the beginning, because in the post punk electronic era, Moog kind of represented old school. And people I knew, we were into kind of the Wasp and the Roland stuff. And also in Germany, a lot of people I knew were into the MS-20. You know, nobody I knew didn't know anybody had a Moog at all. Maybe it was just partly because they were still expensive, partly because the sound, however good it was, represented something a little bit that punk was trying to destroy. And then, and then ARP, which I, you know, the ARP 2600, which is my, you know, if I had one synth that I was going to keep out of all this lot, it would be the ARP 2600. But nevertheless, obviously the Moog is legendary. I mean, I see the Mini Moog and the Modular as two completely different instruments that happen to have co components that are common and have a similar sound. In terms of what I'm looking for when I use them is two completely different things. You know, there are two ways that I find you, you arrive at a sound. One is you have a sound in your head and you try and get it, or you, you have no idea what you want and you just muck about until you get something, which I think to me actually is a bit more exciting, a bit more fun. And it's good for both of those things because it's quite, in one way, it's quite simple. So if you want a bass, it's quite easy to get a bass sound on there, a good, fat, you know, classic Moog bass sound. But if you want to get some other abstract thing on there, because it's modular, you can repatch it and do what you want. So, it, yeah, Moog is such a big sound 
you can't help, which is great on one side, on one kind of side of it, but on the other side, it's quite hard sometimes to fit other stuff around it. And the punch, the sheer weight that a mooc, you know, you push the key, you can see your speaker, poof, you know, reacting, and, and there's nothing quite like it. A mini for doing that. I'm not really excited. unless there's something serious, you know, it's just putting out DC voltage and it's doing something it really shouldn't be doing, in which case your speakers will start smoking any minute. The mini is the only thing that will really do that. And you know, I mean, and that goes for all the other, you know, the later Moog stuff. I don't find it does it, it doesn't have that immediate thump. It just comes, it jumps out of the speakers and sits in the middle of the room and growls at you. Well, the mini Moog is the, um, I always say mini Moog as well because you couldn't have, you know, all those albums uh, that we previously talked about, like the electric cow goes Moog. You couldn't have that if it was Moog. It wouldn't work, would it? So I still, I mean, lots of us say Moog, but it is Moog, which is such a brilliant name. It's, um, but Moog is, uh, the, just the word Moog is iconic. You know, people talked about it when I was a kid, used to see them, a Moog synthesizer. Even if it wasn't a Moog, they were always called a Moog synthesizer. All those bands at, at that time, uh, pop bands had Moogs in them. But obviously, you know, being 15, 16 in the 70s, there's no way I was going to get one because they're so expensive. And when I first got my Mini Moog, which was the one, this is my second one, um, I actually couldn't believe I had one. I was just looking at it for hours and hours and hours. I always regarded my father as, he was a pretty serious guy a, a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time he was pretty serious. Even more serious depending on what grades are brought home in chemistry, but you know, he, generally serious. I had a great sense of humor, um, but he always had a very kind of rare, wise presence uh, that I was very aware of. That changed for me when he died. And the reason it changed or morphed into something bigger, if you will, is because my father really never discussed his career to any extent um, for my entire childhood. And it wasn't until he passed away that I realized, and I think this goes for most of my family as well, to the, uh, the, the impact that his work had had on people's lives. And that's when I began to, to, to see that, um, as I like to say, there's my dad, the cool, cool, geeky, funny guy. And then there's also Bob Moog, this icon who revolutionized the face of music and people's thinking about what all the music could be. He was something bigger than I ever realized as, um, as a child. And that was a a overwhelming dawning that happened um, pretty pretty soon after he passed away. And it's, it's also the genesis, the impetus for the Bob Moog Foundation to be able to carry on that incredible inspiration that he invoked um, in so many people all over the world. Bob loved engineering and he loved to work with musicians. He did not love the business people. He didn't have a good sense of doing business. He had a wonderful sense of doing design and electronic things and building out of musicians' dreams the instruments that would make those dreams come true. Music will never be the same. It will never be the same. I think it's most appealing about Buchla's history is the fact that uh, uh, it's mostly a non-keyboard player instrument. 
um, as opposed to the East Coast School of Synthesis where we have Moog and Wendy Carlos and uh, Keith Emerson and a more more of a way of utilizing the synthesizer from a keyboard player point of view and as a as a as a means to coming up with new sounds with a known interface. On the West Coast with Subotnik and Don's boxes, I think there's more of a there was more of a uh, research into sound as opposed to recreating something that existed already as far as uh, as opposed to the synthesis process that were more of a creative process new sounds uh, not only new sounds but new sounds in space so each one of his machine allowed for an easier placement not only the stereo field but like the quad field quite often so as a non keyboard player I think that I got attracted to that right after I saw them you know the way they looked I think it was the first thing that got me interested in them just because they look like toys. Um, I remember, I think it was Mark Vale's synthesizer book. And I remember seeing these color photos of some of, you know, the later 200 modules were like kind of blue, blue knobs. And I'm like, man, they look like toys. And I just did not know what, you know, like nomenclature. I mean, the, the way whatever was written on the faceplate was just not your typical oscillator and, you know, filter and whatnot. And, it didn't really matter. I was like, I, I got to know what this does. And then that's when I sort of researched uh, the music that was made with the Bukla and uh, Subotnik, obviously. Suzanne Ciani, I, I would probably think it was the, the easiest bridge into the world of Bukla because Suzanne is a very melodic musician. And a lot of the stuff that has been documented that she's done on the Bukla, although the Bukla is a, historically considered an untamable machine, she was able to enslave it into something very melodic, to a certain extent, obviously, the machine won in the end, because she had to give it up. But um, from her stuff to Morton, Morton Subotnik stuff, and um, I realized how a machine could create sounds that were f far from what the synthesizer used to sound at that time, you know, the, the Moog approach, and, and whatever I grew up thinking was a synthesizer, it wasn't a synthesizer anymore, because the Buchla machine uh, it just sounded like something, it could, could have been a, the sound of an animal or a creature from somewhere else in the world or another planet. You know, it sounded like something real, something living, not a machine. And um, I think that's how I got attached to it, not having any background in, in uh, keyboard playing, because I've never studied it. The moment that I joined Nine Inch Nails is when I seriously picked up a keyboard for the first time. So all of a sudden being able to hear a machine that doesn't rely on that sort of input method to create music and at the same time comes up with sounds that you've never heard before to me was a re you know a revelation and a revolution because uh, all of a sudden it's like I gotta get myself one of these boxes and uh, I remember it was 2005 when I met Don during a Nine Inch Nails tour and um, after that tour he called me called me asking if so are you gonna buy one? And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't really afford it right now. But then two years later, I ended up buying my first system, 200E. And uh, from there on, it was just a slippery slope. And, you know, and from there, I, I got more into the vintage stuff, which is the uh, same inter interface, but just different sound, obviously. And that was the end of it, pretty much. <laughs> ended up. Yeah, with a hefty Bukla collection, which, which you know, the thing I like about uh, Bukla's instruments is that Don is uh, also a musician. So the, the base of the creative process comes from his need to create something. It's not hardly ever him listening to somebody else's needs. Maybe at the beginning when, you know, Morton Subotnik and Ramon Sender and everybody at the San Francisco Tech Music Center asked him, commissioned him to build the first Bukla box. I think that's where it stopped. I think that's when Don realized I have my own idea of what I want to do. And uh, every instrument, every module, I think it's a manifestation of that view, which makes it very unique and also compatible just to a few, not many, you know. And I'm not talking about an elite. I'm just talking about the fact that, you know, I mean, there are certain things that are very unique and not everybody likes them. And uh, when I bought my first one, I was very scared because it was a big investment. Probably the biggest investment I had made at the time, which was about twenty or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars US. And I was scared because a lot of the music um, wasn't it was atonal. 
which I like, but I really was scared of buying, for lack of a better description, a, a reactor, you know, Native Instruments reactor in a box. But I was pleasantly surprised because the Bukla 200E allowed me to do both, you know, um, more abstract compositions and songs. So it was more of a confirmation that I had whatever inside anyway, and then it was just a matter of which tool you put in front of me and it'll come out with a specific flavor, but it didn't really matter, you know. So, um, and that, that, I think, the apex of my Bukla relationship came with when I found an older, or one of the first easels, the music easel from the 70s, which are very different from the current uh, easels as far as the way they're built and the way they're, they sound. And, uh, and there were no new easels when I was looking for mine, so maybe I would have stopped if they were available. And, and anyway, they, it, I looked probably for six or seven years for one until I found one. And I remember after a week of having my friend Mark Verbos helping me, or mostly fixing it. I, not, I, was, I was helping like a father outside of in the delivery room helps, you know, by smoking in the balcony. At the time I still smoked, just, what's the smell? Is that you? Oh no, what do you mean no, no, what happened? You know, but after a week he was able to fix it. I remember sitting, setting it up in the studio between two speakers and I recorded for days, days and came up with three and a half hours of music, which then turned into the Forza Records volume one, two, and three, and non-edited, you know, just spent a little time coming up with something that I liked, and then press record, and then perform it live, and and uh, that's how they came up, you know, and uh, to this day, I don't think I've ever been as creative as I've been with that instrument, you know, but what I've learned, besides from the musical output, what I've learned is that um, um, the more limitations the machine gives me, and the, the more I try to work around those limitations, or live with them in a way where I can be creative without feeling like I'm compromising. The easel was a big learning tool for that. Um, makes you realize how much stuff you have and how much you are underusing it just because of the fact that, oh, I'm gonna use this just for that or just for this and just for that. When when you use one instrument only, um, say the book left, to do everything, to do drums and everything, you'll come up with drums that don't sound like any other drum machine or pads that sound like no other pads, just for the simple reason that it's a machine that theoretically wasn't designed for that, you know. and on top of it, I mean, this obviously can apply to any instrument, but I think Bukla has a specific voice as an instrument. I think the way that Don designed them, it's a very unique way of doing it, and um, no matter what, um, no matter how wide, you know, the, the, the market is, I think his designs will always have a unique sound. I think mostly because he's never really based his designs on uh, subtractive synthesis. So, it's hardly ever about having a rich sound and then Sort of shaping it by cutting stuff out. It's always been about FM, wave shaping, you know, and later on wave tables, and so it's more about the richness of the sound to begin with, and with spectral processors, and and a lot about space, you know, and so I think that's one thing that will keep him. Uh, how can I say? It? It'll keep him relevant. I think his his uh, catalog will always be relevant because it's a very unique way of approaching. And, and also consistent because from the 100 up to the 200D, it's you know both in the modulars and the non-modulars instrument. There's an approach that it's present in everything he's done, you know. And um, yeah, I, I, he's a very interesting individual. Also, you know, he's a very very unique character, very stubborn, very sure of what he's doing, with very clear clear ideas, and uh, he's also a good friend. So it's um, it's it's I've been honored. Uh, with his friendship and, and uh, being able to spend time with him and uh, learning why the machines are the way they are. I was in, um, I was manufacturing uh, some 
small modules called operational amplifiers that were made uh, by old-fashioned techniques. In other words, uh, uh, <laughs> resistors and capacitors and uh, transistors. And uh, they were encapsulated and they plugged in uh, to various places and they, uh, we did a, a good business there. Uh, we only had uh, one or two competitors and we sold that company that was called Nexus Research to Teledyne. And uh, <laughs> Teledyne was a uh, very strange outfit. Uh, Singleton was his name. His theory was uh, to uh, acquire uh, small businesses, and he could do this uh, even if uh, at the 20 times earnings, that uh, what he paid for it. And uh, then he would find it easy enough uh, because uh, the market said that, uh, that other people were uh, willing to invest in him at 40 times earnings. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so he made a, a tremendous uh, a killing until uh, the bubble burst someplace. Along. <laughs> uh, well, we, we got a, a quite a bit of uh, uh, capital out of it in those days and, <laughs> and uh, decided that I would like to do something which was more interesting than working for Teledyne. So uh, when Moog came out with a, a way of uh, voltage control and uh, but his, uh, his uh, synthesizers didn't stay in tune. <laughs> so, well, I, uh, so I said to myself, aha, there was a, an opening. Well, how about if I make something to compete with Moog, but it will stay in tune. So here, <laughs> was so a uh, uh, stable anti-logarithmic logarithmic circuit would, would do the trick. So I uh, had a little bit of money from uh, from uh, selling the company, Teledyne, so we started another little company, and uh, we, we, we developed the, the, uh, a large system called the uh, R2500. Uh, it's still around a few. And uh, to me, it, it, that, that was great. Uh, and uh, well, we all were very enthusiastic about it. And I was enthusiastic to the point. I said, how about making you a portable one so that for, uh, that'll be like a musical instrument? It was very difficult to get, uh, to get my way of the thing. And finally, uh, they came up with uh, something which uh, was uh, uh, in a uh, wall metal case. And uh, not only that, but the, the keyboard uh, was exposed so that it would, you could break off the, the, the keys. And uh, I, I finally fired the uh, engineer who, who designed that uh, metal thing. It's, it's still called the Blue Meanie or something. <laughs> and uh, I went down to the, my basement over there and I had some power tools and, and I built a uh, 2600. Uh, and uh, you used the same layout as the Blue Mini, but uh, uh, incorporated a uh, uh, number of nice little features, including uh, a keyboard, which was, it was rugged enough so that uh, the keys were, would not break off when, when you were carrying two units. The first thing I did was work on the 2500. That is when I designed multi-mold filter resonator. The Who used it in that song with a Hammond B3 organ. And then they said, we want to make a low-cost synthesizer because that one sold for something like, oh, $12,000. Al Perlman and I got together, had a big meeting about what should be in it and what it could do, how to control it, and any other suggestions I might have. So I spent the next few months on deciding what kind of circuitry. One thing we knew right from the start was we want three oscillators, voltage control oscillators, variable filter, 
which is limited in that it's only low pass, but it has adjustable resonance or Q, so you can give it a sort of focused sound emphasizing a certain frequency band. And voltage controlled amplifier and a noise generator, random white noise or pink noise. And finally, oh, there was a, what they called a ring modulator. It's basically an analog multiplier, but at the time it used a ring of transistors. So you could modulate one signal with another. Turns out the 2600 did, did, did uh, quite well for the company. And uh, I understand that the 2600s still have a good reputation. And uh, it's very gratifying uh, to know that uh, a lot of musicians have uh, used it. And uh, let's see, uh, Pete Townsend used it. Uh, Kirby Hancock, you name them. They call this semi-modular, don't they? And, I mean, it was all I knew was it was modular as far as I was concerned. You could patch everything in any way you wanted. So when it came to res, it was in my spare bedroom. And so Tracy was downstairs shouting up, oh, that sounds nice, love. You know, like that's a, that was a good sign. She only did that about three times. The other time, I think, was with Born Slippy. That's, <laughs> with Nux, that sounds nice, love, right? Okay, it was good. I also felt kind of desperate because I was mid the piece, mid through the piece, it, the actual res sequence, which is the heart of it, you know. Uh, made me suddenly almost get panicky and go, right, I better finish. This has, to f this has to happen now, you know, really quickly. And I did just throw myself in and finish the, finish the record in about two hours, it, it just because it felt like I, I've got to do this right now, just get it done, the whole, get the whole picture, you know. I wrote the patch down. A uh, day later, I couldn't get it back. Day later, you know, it's like it was one of those really fragile relationships, you know, to get that. I, I still don't know. I've I've never heard anything quite like it that plays with the harmonics the way that Patch did. You know, I love uh, loads of people, don't they? That slightly self-oscillating filter, and, it's, and I could never, I could never get it back. Couldn't even get close. Just sounded wrong, wrong, wrong. There was no, there was no. So sort of funny, you know, these things disappear into the ether. I do like that about it, though. The fragility of it all, you know? And uh, one day I got, uh, somebody rang the door, doorbell. Uh, it was Bob Moog. He says, hey, I understand you guys are uh, about, uh, making synthesizers. He said, you know, I, I'm making synthesizers. Uh, are you sure that you're not uh, uh, copying my synthesizer? I said, well, uh, voltage controlled, yes, uh, but uh, we're doing it in a different way so that you, know, you stay in tune. Uh, and uh, he says, well, I'm going to take a look at what you're doing. And if I find you're using anything that I'm doing, uh, that I've patented, uh, I'm going to stop, put a stop to it. Well, he was good, quite... Uh, unpleasant at the time and uh, well we, we did go ahead and he did uh, he, at that time he had come out with a uh, low pass uh, voltage controlled filter and uh, uh, that filter was very good uh, and uh, uh, I, st I, I really did copy his but that was before his patent issued uh, well, many months went by, and finally his patent issued, and he, he came down like a ton of bricks. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, I had an idea of, of how to do it without. I'm, I guess, a fairly competent uh, analog design engineer, so I had an, uh, another way of doing it, which... <laughs> so when he came up with a uh, lawsuit about that, uh, I said, okay, fine. I said, by the way, you are also doing something that we did. Uh, have a, we, uh, we have a two-voice uh, analog keyboard, and you came up with a two-voice, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, I said, I think there's room for more than one uh, synthesizer uh, manufacturer. 
And he was, uh, you know, he was about, uh, he was a little bit surly about the whole thing. But after a while, uh, he had decided that we were in the same industry, and we, uh, so, uh, we were both uh, building uh, acceptance. Uh, and he got to be friendly. And he had nice things to say about the 2600. And uh, 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 let's see, Mark Bale's uh, book over there has a, uh, uh, a nice little article by Bob Moog about the 2600. He was so bright. He was, he was a modest person, very, very modest. People have some great sins. You know, they, they steadily, when Moog had the mini Moog, and then maybe a few years, I, I don't know, they brought out a few sins, you know, that poly Moog, which had its issues as well. But art seemed to be a lot more organized. So they had their, they started off with their modular. And then obviously they got the 2600 which was a, still a fantastic synth. Then there, the oddity, the oddity, sorry. Freudian slip. Um, and then it just seemed to keep, keep making interesting little machines. They kind of did it right, you know, they, they kept producing, which I suppose is important. You know, they just slimmed down the oddity and brought out the, uh, the art axe, yeah, and there's a Solus so, as well. Um, string machines. Omni. Selena, that was a rebash, man. I think that other people have uh, sort of uh, uh, accepted some of uh, the technology that uh, I invented and uh, my team invented. Dennis Cohen was a very good inventor. Uh, there was another one, Tim Gillette. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, he was a very, very nice English fellow. He developed the uh, pro soloist, a digital pro soloist, and he, he was great. They picked out a keyboard for the soloist and the key contact wires that the key would touch and then the pressure sensitive or velocity sensitive thing was very fragile and very weak and I kept complaining about that for weeks. Look, another one just broke. Why don't we get a good keyboard? Well, they didn't take that too well. Then one Friday, they asked me to stay over time, which in itself I didn't mind, but they wanted me to repair some of these bad keyboards, which was a real pain getting in there, soldering Mickey Mouse as best I could, and complaining and complaining. And finally, Al Promo said, well, if you don't like it, you can always use the door. He said, OK. I had just brought that art proto back from them letting me borrow it. And I had it in my van to return. Well, when I got that word about, well, if you don't like it, there's the door, I immediately grabbed the 2600 and put it back in my van. So about three weeks later, I got a call from Al Perlman. I thought for sure he was going to say, I want that 2600 Proto back. Well, I said, OK. But he said, I really don't care so much about that, Dennis. The reason I called you is I need your lab notebooks. And legally, they're his property, of course. They recognize that. Three big notebooks full of all the circuitry and everything on it. So I returned them, and he might have mentioned the 2600 or not. I don't think he did. I think he, nothing was said, so I didn't say anything. I had talked to him periodically. In fact, once I made a version of that hyperphase pedal for him after showing it to him because he wanted one. And that was the last I had seen of Al Perlman until maybe 10 years ago when I called him to see how he was. Some of the punks took on the arps, I think. I mean, the Stranglers, you know, they had the, he used to love his mini mode, didn't he, Dave Greenfield? But then you had bands like Magazine, who were big kind of arp users. Um, Ultravox, of course. In 1977, 
it was time for Ultrabox to get a, a synthesizer in there because uh, we were signed to Ireland Records with Ultravox and we were about to do our second album. The first album had consisted of just hiring stuff and trying things like uh, string machines. But I'd never actually got my hands on a, a synthesizer. Uh, and um, so I, I can't remember why I decided. I think I just liked the shape of it. And I just remember bringing it into the rehearsal room at Ireland and then the, the whole band just completely going berserk on it. I had to stand back while they just went completely nuts on it. And, and I was like, hmm, don't break it, you know. Uh, but so they just went completely mental for about an hour, just messing about with it, laughing at it and just having a great time, really loud. Yeah, and slowly but surely, it, uh, the whole feeling for the instrument started to develop. It's not tempered or anything, but it held back. It's just raucous. The punks used to just shut up there because, you know, you used to take their heads off, just like what I'm saying. I used to have take my, nearly take my own head off. Uh, they just, that was it. It was like straight between the eyes. And it looked like that. It looked the part. Where's the mini Moog, please? Not really. Uh, that looked a bit, you know, you had, looked like you just stepped out of university, you know, bloody, give us a break. And there it was, on a plate there for you, and straight through between the eyes. It was ridiculous. Um, power. Absolute power. And that's what I was after. When I joined um, Tubeway Army, we were, they were called Tubeway Army then, we were just out rehearsing to go out and do some more club gigs, which is what I've been doing all the time. And I was sort of ready for that. Battle stations again, you know. <laughs> but things just suddenly changed when he got the success of our friends Electric and uh, we were playing in big places. And I thought it was a great opportunity for me and Gary gave me the opportunity to do a long solo, so that was great. And that's I think that's where I got the sound, my sort of sound. Using sync of the first and second oscillator, I just used to have a soft sound, i.e. the sound in The Quiet Man or a Slightly Harder or, or Vienna, or a hard sound really, like the solo in Sleepwalk. You get pressure though when you're in a band uh, to change just because you're a synthesizer player. And I just used to say, well, aren't you still playing the same guitar? I have to give myself a bit of a pinch sometimes when I realise what it's ended up on that instrument, that one instrument, yeah. Well, for a perfect example, uh, as regards successful tracks, <laughs> as opposed to uh, Fade to Grey, uh, that's, I remember recording that actually in 19, early 1979 when I was working with Gary Newman. So I laid that down then, in the middle of 1979, at Martin Russian's studio. I've got the hard sound on On Broadway with Gary, that solo. And then there's a soft sound on Vienna, which was heard a lot. And then, of course, in something like about 83, I think, I did that um, track on Phil Linnett's solo album, Yellow Pearl. And as soon as I'd done it, I heard it on the, as a Top of the Pops theme, you know, with my the vocals off and strangely my sequential bit, I did a bit of sequencer on that fancy stuff, pushed right up to the front. Weird that, isn't it? I thought, who the hell's that? Every week. So that, I mean, it's just been heard ridiculously so, you know, and that's, fanta that's a fantastic feeling, uh, being heard by millions and millions of people from when it was first brought into the rehearsal room with Ultravox, you know, in 1977. Well, it's, it's been very uh, pleasant uh, you know, knowing that I really did make some contributions. <laughs> Never made any money at it, but still. <laughs>
Now Harry was already an inventor of note, helping to design the electrical system of the B-29 Super Fortress. He'd also devised a machine that allowed one man to insulate a house as opposed to an entire team, and the car windshield washer. But it was when he was sat at Hammond organ recording some tunes to send to his parents that he hit upon an idea. And the idea was simple. Surely it's possible to record any instrument to tape chromatically and then lay each of those notes under a key. And this was a eureka moment and he set to work and he developed and refined various prototypes until he realised his idea. Sounds were initially recorded at home, but later by the Lawrence Welk Orchestra, and eventually he started to sell these instruments as Chamberlain branded instruments. And the concept was simple. Under each key was a sliver of tape. And when the key was pressed, the tape was dragged across a tape head until it reached the end, usually after about eight seconds. Whereupon it's released and a spring, or later motors, rewound the tape ready for it to be played again. Now in terms of sounds, they varied from straight chromatic recordings of instruments including flutes, saxophones, guitars and vibes, etc. right up to full musical motifs under each note. Now being an electromechanical device, there were inherent problems. Firstly, there was no internal chassis, so if the instrument moved, the tapes would become misaligned with the tape heads and cause obvious problems. Secondly, because the tape heads weren't matched, even if you left it unmoved, the tonal variations between each note were obvious. Anyway, one day, Harry's beavering away in his workshop and his window cleaner hears these magnificent noises coming from within. And intrigued, he asks to see what is making this music. And he's immediately blown away and offers to become Harry's salesman. Now this window cleaner was called Bill Franson and he's gone on to become a kind of pantomime villain of sorts because after a while, frustrated by the inherent problems with the instrument, he asked Harry if he could solve them and then Julie vanished. Completely unbeknown to Harry, what Bill had done is get on a boat bound for England complete with two dual manual Chamberlain Music Master 600s. Rumour has it that somewhere along the journey the instruments magically became rebadged as Franson instruments and on arrival he put an advert in a newspaper looking for a company who could make match tape heads. This was answered by a company called Bradmatic whose interest was piqued at an order of 70 tape heads so they asked to see the instrument and were duly blown away. In fact, so much so that they bought the rights to the instrument from Bill Franson. Rights that Bill actually didn't own. And so the Chamberlain 600 became what's known as the Mellotron Mark I. Are you saying that all those Chamberlain sounds predate the Mellotron ones? Because, I mean, I have to say, if you're trying to, you know, okay, if you want a Mellotron sound, obviously use that, but if you want a kind of degraded sounding violin or cello or, you know, orchestral instrument, Chamberlain sound good. I mean, they're usable. I actually, you know, have used the Chamberlain orchestral sounds a lot. Now, meanwhile, Harry, oblivious to Bill's bit of subterfuge, eventually wonders, well, where the hell is he? And rumour has it that after hearing the radio still on in his apartment, the door was kicked in, but obviously there's still no trace of Bill. So Harry carried on as usual, building music masters and rhythm make drum machines. Now these drum machines also used tapes and were mostly recorded with Harry's son Richard playing drums and various models were offered for sale over the years. Not only does it sound great, and the recordings are just so idiosyncratic, but it's got a, a limited palette. That's its beauty. It sounds great as well. It sounds great. I mean, just I came in, walked in, and just looking at it as a piece of furniture, you know it's going to sound great. You just look at the cloth on it. It's got sparkles. That's, that's, that's classic great sound, isn't it? Sparkles. Um, I think it's wonderful. I think it's really it's a wonderful piece of kit.
In the early 60s, Harry got wind of this machine in the UK that appeared to be identical to his. So after talking to Frank, Norman and Les Bradley from Bradmatic, he was invited over to the UK to sort things out. I think it took all of five minutes for him to realise that, you know, the Bradleys had behaved entirely honourably and that everybody had been duped by Bill. So an agreement was reached and they partly company amicably. All except Bill, of course, and actually rumour has it that Harry refused to shake his hand at the end of it all. Anyway, Harry returned to the US and continued refining and making Chamberlain instruments. Now the most popular of these was the Chamberlain M1, a portable instrument not dissimilar to the Mellotron M400, and this was used by a variety of artists back then, including David Bowie on the Low Album, uh, and is still used to great effect today by people like Patrick Warren and John Bryan. The commercial flagship of the Chamberlain range is this M4. It weighs 300 kilos, and this one belonged to Three Dog Night, who actually toured with it during the 80s. Now, the only sound that's shared between the Chamberlain and Mellotron is the famous three violin sound that's graced just about every 60s and 70s recording, from Moody Blues to Yes and Genesis, you name it pretty much. And it's these evocative sounds, together with Harry's tenacity and engineering genius, and how a simple idea and subsequent eureka moment led to the inception of two instruments, the Chamberlain and the Mellotron. Expand his horizons. Oh, Harry, you had better watch out. 